Welcome to another procedural texturing tutorial. In this one, we are going to be looking at creating procedural hexagonal tiles. It's really quite a simple process, but it's a little bit of math. At the end of this, we will have ourselves a little node group that will allow us to change the scale of the overall texture, allows us to change the tile size. The profile depth is to do with our displacement map. You can see that the profile depth is to do with the angle of that profile that we put on the edge. The seed value is going to give us access to changing a random output. In this instance, we have put this through a gate just so that we can use multiple different textures. So there we have it. I think this one's going to be useful. Let's get stuck in. We're going to be using Blender 2.82. Just go to your preferences, add-ons, make sure you got the Node Wrangler enabled. Hop over into our texturing workspace and I'm just going to add a plane. Going to be working with UV coordinates. I'm just going to use a UV map input, shift tab to make it snap to grid. So the reason I'm using UV map instead of object coordinates is I want to be able to have control over how this wraps around objects. Let's start off by having a look at a hexagon. A hexagon obviously has six sides. And if we draw lines through it from corner to corner, we can see that it's made up of six triangles. And I can tell you that these triangles are all equilateral, meaning that they have 60 degree corners in all three corners and also all side lengths are equal. This is very useful to us for a number of reasons. Firstly, it's gonna help us work out how a rise over tread. Another thing that we can see about the hexagon is that we have got symmetry in two axes, which means that if I just draw this side, then I can use the absolute of the X and the absolute of the Y, and I can get a full hexagon. So I only need to think about drawing one quarter of it. If we take this side, which is length one from here to here, and to work out my gradient, I'm gonna use this triangle. So if this is length one, and this we can say is length one, and this, therefore, we can say is length one as well. So we have a hypotenuse of this triangle is two, and this vertical section is one. Then we can use Pythagoras to work out what this length is. So we can say a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So a squared plus one squared equals two squared, which is our hypotenuse length there. So now we can say that a squared plus one equals four. So therefore a squared equals three. We subtract the one from both sides. If we square root each side, we get a equals root three. So that's going to give us the angle we want here. Then we just want the vertical line as well. And if we use the absolute, then we'll be able to make it reflect in both axes. We're going to take up a UV map and get our vertical lines with a separate xyz and use the x and a greater than just so that we can see what's going on. Now to get our angle we're going to use something called the dot product and the dot product allows you to set an angle. If I put a greater than on here you can see that with vector 1 1 in here we have a rise of 1 and we have a tread of 1. Now what if I was to put 1 and root 3 in here? If we take a combine xyz, take a 1, now we're going to take a math node, square root, so this is the square root of 3 and then this is going to the dot product. You can see that we're getting the slope that we want. Now to combine these two I'm going to be using a maximum. Now something that you might have noticed, we're not getting the full hexagon. And this is because we are only working within one quadrant. So what I need to do is I need to move these coordinates. So I'm going to use another vector math here. I'm going to subtract 0.5 from the X and the Y. This is going to center our coordinates. And I'm going to use another one that we're going to set to absolute. So now if we have a look at our maximum and we put a greater than node on here, just so that we can see what is happening. What we have is a diamond and that's not exactly what we're after. The reason for this is that our vector here needs to be normal normalized and that means resetting to within the 0 to 1 range. So at the moment we have square root of 3 which is around about 1.7 and we have 1 here and so this needs to be reduced this very easily with a converter vector math. Drop it on there, set this to normalize. As soon as you do that you can see that we've got ourselves a hexagon. And this hexagon is completely controlled by the size that we put in this greater than node. So we can start going towards this solution quite quickly. Next thing we need to work out how to do is tile this. To do this we're going to be using a scale. It's going to let us change the scale of this. And then following that, we're going to use a modulo. Previous episodes, we have used fraction quite a lot. This time, we need to be using modulo. So I'm just going to set this to one in both. Immediately, we can see an issue. Hexagons need to tile in an offset way. Excuse me, terrible drawing. But this is how we have to offset them, not one above the other in a square grid like this. In order for us to do this, we're going to use two arrays of hexagons. One is going to be this set and two is going to be this set and you can imagine that they go everywhere else. So to begin with we need to start putting together our hexagons in a way that is going to leave room for the hexagons to go in between. So I'm going to set this to five. For the moment we are modulating at one and one. The x needs to be higher. You can see that we're clipping off the bottom and that is because we are subtracting this as well. So whatever this ends up being we need this 
to be a half of that so that it offsets and always centers within the space. It's gonna be somewhere around this. Let's have a quick look at what's going on. So we want to know the distance between here and we have the distance between these. So we know that this equals one and we want to know what this value is gonna be. We also know that it's gonna go through the center of this one. Seeing what we saw before about our hexagons, we can assume the same maths is true here. So we have a value of one here. This distance in between these centers is also gonna be one and one, so therefore two, a one here, and therefore we can say this is gonna be root three. We already happen to have one root three here for our vectors to center. We need to be taking half of this and offsetting it by that amount. So we can take another vector math node, set it to divide and plug it into the bottom of that subtract. Set all of our values to two. So far, so good. What I need for my alternate row is for them to be offset by half of this amount to go across by 0 0.5 and up by half of root three. We have a node which is giving this, so a half of our vector here. We already have all of this math in place. Just for convenience, I'm gonna go shift right click across here so that I have a reroute. I'm gonna duplicate everything except from these four first ones. So control shift D, so I want those inputs. And I'm just gonna put them directly underneath. At the moment, these are outputting the exact same information. I'm gonna add a vector mapping node. I'm gonna take the vector from our scale and plug it into the vector input. And I'm gonna plug this vector into this modulo. Now you can see if I move this mapping input, we get something going on. So now that we want to take this divide by two node, plug it into the location. I'm just going to change these nodes from greater than to less than. And that is just going to invert the output. So now we have white tiles. And this is because I want to be providing UV coordinates for all of the tiles. We're going to use these tiles. These are our modulated tiles, which we're modulating at one and root three. And these are going to be the texture coordinates for each of our tiles. So take a converter vector math, set it to multiply. We're going to take that and we're going to plug it into the bottom. So we have this, which is our mask and our texture coordinates and we're multiplying them together to give us the texture coordinate per tile. Just gonna do the same on the other stream, add the multiply, add the subtract to it. Now I need to combine both of these, so I'm gonna use an add node. Now we have all of our UVs per tile, and the next thing I want to do is, at the moment, all of our grout is just set to black, which is not gonna map an image or any sort of texture to it. So we're gonna to need to put the original texture coordinates across the whole plane as well. So I'm just gonna shift right click, myself a reroute just so that I've got it available. I need to find a way to make Blender understand that I want to put these UV coordinates just on the spaces in between, not over the whole thing. To do that, I'm going to take both of my less than nodes and set this to add, add this one. Now see that we have this output that's showing all of our tiles. And I'm going to add a color, mix RGB, and put this into the factor. The tiles are white and the grout is black. So this texture coordinate can go into the first socket, the zero socket, and we can put this into the second one. So now we have UV coordinates everywhere. So these are our finalized UV coordinates. The next thing, I would like to do is some way of creating randomized coordinates. One of the great things about proceduralism is that we don't have to deal with tiling. For us to do this, where we have this modulo, we're going to control shift D, bring it down. So it wants to keep all of these input nodes so that everything is mapped in the same place. But instead of modulating, we are snapping. If I have a look at this, we can see that we have linear tiles. Take a texture, white noise texture. I'm going to plug it in there. And as you can see that we now have a random value per cell. If I set this to 40, then we get the seed as well. I need to do the exact same thing up here. So I'm going to take this modulo, control shift D, set to snap. I'm going to just copy this white noise. So it's already 4D. I'm going to plug that one in. And this one now has all of those tiles. Now I need to mask it onto the specific tiles to join these two together. So we have a gray socket. We have our tile mask, which is also a gray socket. So I can use a math node set to multiply. And there we go. So that is our first line with a random value per tile. I'm going to do the exact same thing over this one. I'm going to add them together just like how we did here. I'm going to add these two and now you can see that we have all of our random tiles and I want the tiles to all be different so I'm going to go vector mapping drop it on there and then I don't want to change the rotation and I don't want to change the scale so I'm just going to drop this into the location and it's basically going to move things left right up or down depending on the value that it's got from the white noise textures so so far we have got our standard texture coordinate which is just uniform for everything we've got a randomized texture coordinate and we have also got this which is like a material mask between the grout material and the tile material. The last big thing that we want to do with this is a displacement section, a height section. First of all, I just want to join up these two less thans so that we're not adjusting the rows individually. I want them all to adjust together. I'm going to add a color invert because I like having sliders. I want to hide this bottom section of it. So if I just plug into the top, 
and plug the top out and then go control H and then I can disconnect it from everything. So we just needed to plug in and plug out so that we were using those node sockets, um, but we're not actually changing anything just so that we have only that slider. I'm going to go N to bring up my panel, rename this tile size. When we get to 0.5, tiles meet. So 0.5 is the maximum size that we can go to. So rather than just having this go up to 0.5, I'm going to divide the output by two. So now what you can see is that we have a slider that lets us affect all of the sizes of all of our tiles together. Now we could just use this as it is for our displacement map and it would be a very sharp fall off. You would just have the tiles being one height and then immediately the grout would be another height. What if you wanted some kind of profile on the edges of your tiles to make them a little bit more realistic? Let's have a look at some of the things that we have available. We've got our maximums here. So these give us the gradients from the center of the tiles outwards. These aren't just length gradients because they're not circular. They don't point in all directions. They point out in wedges. We're going to take both of these and we're going to add them together with a minimum node. This node set to minimum is going to display the minimum value of either of these two streams of information that are coming in. Next I'm going to invert it by taking one and subtracting it from it. I am also going to invert our tile size factor here and then I'm going to put both of these through a mix RGB. The tile size factor goes into the factor of the mix RGB and we're going to set this to color burn I'm going to set color 2 to be black. The plateau of the tile, we're going to use a color dodge and set this to be white. Now we can push out that center section, leaving us just with a section of this, which goes from a value of 1 to a value of 0. And this is falling off linearly. But if we would like that to have some kind of profile, then we could put in a mix RGB. And let's say, for example, that I want to go for a vector handle here, then I can get a sharp fall off. So maybe I want it to be some kind of interesting profile like that. Let's have a look at what we've done with an actual displacement node. So I'm going to add a principal BSDF and I'm just going to run this through blank. I'm going to switch over to cycles and up here I'm just going to switch these. I'm going to go to an interior scene. I'm going to add a vector displacement node. I'm going to plug from the color here into the height information, the height input of the displacement, and I'm going to plug the output into the displacement output of the material node. At the moment you can see that we are not getting anything, it's completely flat. The reason is there is not enough geometry, so we can go subdivide Set to simple, turn on adaptive. For adaptive to show, you need to be in the experimental feature set. This still isn't showing, and that is because we have not changed it from bump to displacement and bump. We do have displacement, but it is much, much, much too high. So I'm just gonna reduce this to 0.02 something like that, something very low. You can see that we are getting this profile projected onto that edge. We can increase the color dodge to make it a smaller profile and we can move these points around to think about how we want to do that fall off. So real quick, we're just going to put this all into a group node so that we have access to it easily within materials in the future. So I'm just going to disconnect all of the outputs and I'm going to select everything. Control G. And the first thing I want to connect is the output. So I want my coordinates. I could just click and drag this out directly, but then it's going to give me this yellow color socket. And that is not actually what I want. I want to select a blue socket. That's given me the vector output that I would like. I'm just going to leave that called vector. And I'm going to take this one, which is my randomized vector. I'm going to take my material mask, which is this middle one. I'm actually going to add the random color per tile as well. You never know when something like this is useful for adjusting the color, for example, of a material. So that's what that one's outputting. And then I also would like the height map to be drawn. But again, this is only black and white information, so I don't want to be using the yellow socket. So I'm just going to take a gray socket and plug it in to give me a gray socket. And then I'm going to plug in from there. I'm going to rename this one height. That is all of our outputs. I'm going to go to my node group and I'm going to rename it hex tiles. Let's have a look at our inputs. I always want to have a texture coordinate on the outside, so I'm just going to plug that in. I'm going to delete the vector in here, and I'm going to add input UV map and plug that into the outside here. I want to connect my scale. It's going to give us the scale of the texture. The next really big one is going to be the size of the tiles. So if I just plug this into our tile size vector up here, you can see this is going to give us a slide for that. And what I can actually do is I can hop back in. So if I want to get rid of this, just control X and that will dissolve the node. So now I have a factor controlling the size of my tiles. This slider on the color ramp, if we switch over to our height, you can see that this is what controls the depth of our profile. I'm going to connect that. So now we have two facts, so I need to rename these. The top one was our tile size and the bottom one is our profile depth. I can't unfortunately put this on the outside, but I can go and color it just so in the future. It's a little bit easier for me to find. And the last thing I want to do is I want to sort out the random seed because you may want to change your randomness while you're working. 
if we come from our input here, go to the W, and again, W to the W, rename that W to be seed. And just on this bottom one, I'm gonna take a converter math, drop it on to that noodle, and I'm just gonna add one so we always have a difference between them. Let's just have a quick look at what we can do with it. So a nice simple setup would be adding a image texture. I'm just gonna open this one of a ceramic plate. And if I put the vector into here, you can see that we've got tiling. Every single tile looks the same, but if we take the randomized vector instead, we do have a few bits, although you can mix this up. Now, if I wanna make the grout a little bit darker, for example, then I could take a color, mix RGB, and I'm gonna take the material mask, which is just a black and white, and I'm gonna use that as the mix factor. And then I'm gonna change this from mix to color. And with this, I'm just going to change the color of my tiles to be slightly more terracotta. So now if I plug this terracotta tile into the base color of my principal shader, if we take our displacement and we take the height information into the height of that displacement, then you can immediately see that we're starting to get some displacement occurring. I would like to increase my tile size and I would also like to increase the number on that to cinch them down. And I'm also going to reduce my displacement height. If I wanted to change that profile, I would just have to tab in, go up to this RGB curve and play with the profile here. I'm just going to speed model something just to show how we can use this texture. Just making a really simple scene using basic box modeling techniques. Try and use as many modifiers as possible, just help me along. So subsurf, mirror and solidify I use quite a lot. I found an image of a bathroom on Pinterest and that's what I am just doing a quick study of here. and cables I always use, Bezier Coast. I import a few accessories from another bathroom scene that I've done, so just a few shampoo bottles and a towel and leaves that I can place in just for a little bit of extra set dressing. Sorting out my materials now, I'm actually going to take the material mask as a factor into a mix RGB, plug that into the roughness, set it to mix, and with a couple of values I can set what my grout and tile roughness is. Bearing in mind that the grout is slot zero, so the first one, I'm going to make that completely rough and I might just bring back the tiles to be slightly shiny and I'm just going to reduce this displacement even more. If you find that your floor texture is looking too samey, there's a little trick. We've got a random value and we have our randomized coordinates. In lesson two we made something called a gate which allows us to take a random value and split four colors or textures across it. So if we go file append lesson two the node tree and import the gate. So now under shift a group gate we can take our random value and put that into the seed. Now you can see we have four different colors. The grout however is taking that first color. So if we want to do something with that then we need to use the material mask. Just putting that through a mix node with the material mask go to the factor. I'm now going to bring in four image textures. So now if I plug each of these into our gate then we get them randomly distributed. These will be distributed according to our seed value. Obviously these are very far out from each other in terms of their value and color so consider that when you choose your textures. So we have individual tiles of various material. The image is technically offset slightly on each one and the distribution is randomized as well through that random gate which is why I really like to have my random value on the outside of a group node. So that wraps this one up. We have got our hexagon tiles which is going to output our general vectors. We have our randomized vectors, a mask between tile and grout, a random value per tile and the height information. I hope this has been useful. I see quite a lot of people posting things with hexagonal tiles and a lot of the time they have modeled the tiles individually so hopefully this has given a viable alternative to modeling. We have touched on some new nodes such as the normalized node and 
maximum node. If you're wondering what anything is, check down in the description. There'll be a list of all of the different nodes that I've used and a little cheat sheet for some shortcuts. And also I'm going to be putting a link to my final node tree, which I will just give some little annotations to. So thanks for tuning in. Hope you've enjoyed it. I'll catch you in the next one.